Okay, we're going to start immediately with questions. Um, I would just like, if it's possible, for those who have a strong dissenting opinion uh, and have the courage uh, to express it, uh, I'd like to hear from dissenters first, um, because everyone was very respectful of me, and I, d I have an obligation to be respectful of those who sat quietly uh, and disagreed. So go ahead. You asked us to ask you earlier, why are you opposed to the movement to boycott, divest, and sanction Israel because of its behavior? Okay. Um, first of all, just as a factual matter, uh, obviously I'm not against boycotts, I'm not against divestment, and I'm not against sanctions. Long before there was a BDS movement, I was involved, and there's a public record. I was involved in trying to get, for example, church organizations to divest their holdings from uh, companies that were doing business in the occupied territories. So the issue of the tactic, boycotts, divestment, and sanctions, uh, on the tactic, obviously, there's no dissent from, by me. That's a perfectly legitimate uh, and reasonable uh, and useful, productive tactic. The question is not the tactic, the question is the um, object, the goal. Now, BDS uh, claims it's not just a tactic, it's also a platform. It has a political platform. And BDS, uh, like myself, uh, believes that the only way to reach a broad public is by anchoring your platform in international law. That has been my opinion for the last 10 or 15 years, and anybody who's read what I've written will know that overwhelmingly I rely on human rights organizations and international law to make my case and to try to isolate Israel as a serial violator of um, human rights law and of international law when it comes to the Israel-Palestine conflict. So on that point, on that score, there's no difference at all between BDS and myself in terms of the goal. In fact, with all due modesty, I would say that BDS, as much of the Palestinian support solidarity movement, finally came around to the position that I, um, I uh, first set out. The question then is, BDS originates on July 9th, 2005, one year after the International Court of Justice opinion on the wall that Israel was building in the occupied Palestinian territories. And it says, we as an organization, BDS, has emerged because international law is not being respected. Here's what the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, said. The wall is illegal. The wall has to be dismantled. But the international community is not doing it. And therefore, we, BDS, have to do it. We have to bring to bear boycott, divestment, sanctions. There, there's no difference. There's nobody who wrote more extensively on that ICJ opinion than myself. No one. And now they say, based on international law, we claim for Palestinians three rights. They say right number one, that the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza has to end. I agree with that. Right number two, there has to be full equality of Palestinian Israeli citizens in Israel. Of course, I agree with that. <coughs> Right number three, under international law, there has to be the right of return, has to be implemented. That's the law. I argued it long before BDS ever argued it. And of course, there's no disagreement. But now a problem arises. BDS is asked, where do you stand on Israel? And they say, we take no position. They say, we're agnostic on the case of Israel. We take no position. Some people as individuals will say, well, we support one state, but as an organization, we take no position. 
Everybody is familiar with that, I suppose, in this room. But well, we have a problem here. The problem is you might not take a position, but international law does take a position. You say you're anchored in international law. Look at the UN General Assembly. It has an annual resolution, peaceful settlement of the question of Palestine. It calls for two states on the 1967 border. About 160 countries each year support that resolution. About seven oppose it. The United States, Israel, the South Pacific Island of Nauru, the South Pacific Island of Palau, uh, the Marshall Islands, uh, Micronesia, and usually either Australia or Canada, depending on the year. Israel's allies are seriously diminishing because of global warming. Uh, Nauru and Palau uh, won't be around much longer, uh, 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 which is one reason they should oppose uh, Donald Trump, because Donald Trump is, doesn't believe in climate change, but climate change is accounting for the fact that they'll be losing half their allies in the next couple of years. Um, in any event, uh, they say two states. That's the law. Turn to the International Court of Justice. That's, it was on the basis of the ICJ opinion that BDS was formed. And the opinion says the last line. The last line, it says, we look forward to the creation of two states, a Palestinian state beside Israel. That's what they say. That's the law. Now, you have the option, you have the choice of saying, I don't give a darn what the law is. The law is colonial law, it's racist law, it's imperialist law, imperialist law. You have that option. But what you don't have, unless you're a hypocrite, what you don't have is the option of saying you support international law, but you take no position on Israel. That's not the law. Now, uh, BDS agrees with me, and I'm going to put it that way because I said it a long time before BDS. In the United States, for better or for worse, the only way you can reach a broad audience is by appealing to the law and saying Israel is a lawbreaker. George Corey, he was telling me correctly, in 1971, when he was at Berkeley, there was an anti-imperialist not league, what was it called? Anti-imperialist coalition. And there were all sorts of communist organizations and socialist organizations. And there was a Soviet bloc. And there were national liberation movements and all sorts of other things. There was something else you could appeal to. You could appeal to class struggle. You could appeal to anti-colonial struggle. That era, for better or for worse, it's a mixed era, that era is over. The maximum you can hope to reach is what I would call the horizon of progressive political opinion. What is that horizon? The General Assembly, the International Court of Justice, human rights organizations take our own political situation. What is the most left progressive alternative in the UK that has a reach to a broad audience? Well, the answer is obvious. It's Jeremy Corbyn, who likely will be the next prime minister of the UK. What is the left most progressive uh, movement in the US that can reach a broad audience? The answer is simple. It's Bernie Sanders, who possibly, there's a realistic possibility, obviously no certainty, that he will be the next president of the United States. Now, Bernie and Jeremy, they're very firm. You have to recognize Israel. If you don't recognize Israel, don't talk to me. Literally, don't come to my office, don't talk to me. It's a non-starter. Now, you want me, or this movement, wants to saddle me with a platform 
that can't reach anybody. And I'm not going to do that. I want to reach people. I am 64 years old. I started this when I was 29. I am not doing this to cast poses, to be more radical than thou, to be more pure than thou. I want to achieve something. Now, there are a lot of professors who have tenure who go around now saying, I'm a liberal Zionist, and they are radical and pure. Really? Well, you guys have tenure. I spoke my mind, and I've been unemployed for 11 years. I had worked four weeks in the last 11 years, four weeks in Turkey. So nobody's going to tell me or give me lectures about me being a liberal Zionist, whatever that crap happens to mean. I want to reach people. I want to help people. I want to help the people of Gaza. I have no interest in spouting empty, vacuous, pointless slogans in between attending wine and cheese parties at your department meetings. That's not what I'm about. But I am well past the age of belonging to a cult, which I belonged to as a young person. I was a Maoist, a follower of Chairman Mao. Mao Zedong, live like him, dare to struggle, dare to win. I passed that phase. I thought I was doing good. I did believe the world revolution was on the horizon. I did. I did. I was wrong. I was wrong. And I'll freely admit it. I was wrong. But part of growing up is learning from your mistakes. As Cassius Clay, as he was called back then, later known as Muhammad Ali, the boxer, he says, if you think at age 40 exactly what you thought at age 20, he said, you wasted 20 years. <laughs> and I'm 64. I'm not going to waste those years. I want to learn from my errors. I'm as radical as I was back then. But it depends on what you mean by radical. Does radical mean looking in a mirror and seeing how wonderfully pure you are? Or does radical mean trying to achieve the maximum that's possible within the circumstances that we have been uh, set, that have been set for us? And that, to me, is radical. I'll reach for the maximum. But I'm not going to reach for something that's going to end up isolating me with a sect of totally ineffectual, not to mention totally hypocritical, totally hypocritical purists. You go around saying you support international law, and then when it comes to Israel, you take no position. Well, then what's everyone else going to say? They'll say, when it comes to Palestine, I, I won't take a position either. If you won't take a position on Israel, then why do we have to take a position on Palestine? If you say Palestine has a right to self-determination, Palestine has a right to statehood, then you have to say the same thing for Israel. That's the law. That's the law. I can't change that, and I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I can't defend something I don't believe in. If, any, if, there's any, if I have any persuasiveness among the public, it's one because of my mastery of the facts, and I'm not going to go, you know, no false modesty. I studied enough. I spent 35 years just reading these reports. I don't know why God, you know, everybody has a purpose in this world. I don't know why God gave me that purpose. I, I really, I really, I don't understand it. These reports are so boring, uh, you know. Uh, but the other reason I have credibility is people know I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I'm not going to pretend to something that's not true. I know what the law is. I've studied the law. If you look at the back of my book, I did not study law professionally. 
I sat down and I learned it because I felt it was the only way to reach people. And the top, human, the top uh, international lawyers in the world, John Dugard, Alfred Desaius, they all attest to my grasp of the law. And I'm not going to start betraying all of my study. I'm not going to betray all of it with this kind of hypocrisy that says uh, we're anchored in international law, but we take no position on Israel. It's not tenable, and it's totally hypocritical. Uh. You don't have to applaud. You ask me my position, you know. You don't have to agree.